Great bit of rainforest to be protected. And I'm Amanda Burrell. I'm in London to find out how to make old houses green. And I'm Sinead O'Shea, and I'm in Berlin, where they're bringing the bees back. Unsustainable logging has destroyed nearly 80% of the world's ancient forests. The remaining 20% and the indigenous people and wildlife that live within them are facing a precarious future. I'm Maylene McNamara and I'm heading into Canada's Great Bear Rainforest where a sustainable solution has finally been found. Stretching 750 kilometers along British Columbia's coast, the Great Bear Rainforest is known to locals as Canada's Amazon. Its 6.4 million hectares make it one of the largest remaining temperate rainforests on Earth and one of the most productive ecosystems. However, much of this forest was not always protected. Seaplane, the only way to fly. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> For years, the forest was clear-cut by loggers. Throughout the 1990s, it became a notorious environmental battleground, with conservationists pitted against logging companies. All the while, the old-growth forest remained vulnerable, which is 7% protected. Patrick, can you tell me what it was like during the conflict in the 1990s? It was very difficult. Um, we were, I mean, you know, the term war in the woods has been used. I mean, I think that essentially we were at, at war between the forest products industry and the environmental community, and then our, our customers were brought into that as well. When did it change? When was the moment when it changed? It changed in 1999 after the German paper makers and German publishers came to the Great Bear Rainforest with Greenpeace. Uh, took every, as I like to say, afterwards they took everybody to the woodshed and said, you guys got to fix this. Uh, the industry made a decision that it needed a, a new strategic approach. Uh, and that strategic approach would be based on dialogue and collaboration with uh, environmental groups. In 2009, everything came together. Environmental groups, logging companies, First Nations and the government announced a landmark collaboration, the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement. This put one third of the forest totally off limits to logging. It also legislated a new system of lighter touch selective logging for the remaining two thirds. It gave First Nation communities $120 million to develop a conservation economy as an alternative to logging. And it established a five-year plan to further control logging in the remainder of the forest, a major victory for environmentalists. Do you think you've changed, Patrick, since the beginnings of the conflict uh, more than 20 years ago now? Well, in the early 1980s, I was a logger. Right. Uh, and that's how I made my living. And uh, so, yeah, I've changed a lot. I mean, I'm not opposed to logging, obviously, but uh, we certainly do things very different today. One of the people of the forest is Marvin Robinson from the Gitgau tribe, who works as a bear guide. Today, a Greenpeace activist and I are with him to see wildlife that would not have survived without the agreement. Eduardo, tell me a bit about this amazing place. It's an extraordinary place. We are close to the heart of the Great Bear Rainforest um, right now, and we're heading very close to where um, the land of the spirit bear actually is. And basically, if you can imagine an area the size of Switzerland, that is the Great Bear Rainforest. How much damage does clear cutting do to a forest? A, a lot of damage. Um, it, very basically, like on a very large scale, if you can imagine, you know, it's taken hundreds if not thousands of years for some of these forests to mature, these old growth forests, old growth trees that in some cases in the Great Bear Rainforest here are 1,500 years old. Uh, it's extraordinary and massive, massive trees. Uh, and for those trees to mature, for the, the, the forest to mature, it, it, it's all about relationships. And those relationships take time to establish between species. Uh, when you cut uh, on a very large scale and on a large frequency, you are destroying those relationships. And you wipe out the memory, really, that exists in, uh, on the land between species. So Marvin, our guide, who's driving the boat, has just spotted a humpback whale straight in front of us. who's just uh, tailed, so we're going to go and check it out. If we get a bit closer... Oh, it's blowing! Do you see it? It's blowing! That way! Right there! Here goes his tail. It's going. Wow! Woo! Oh, it's 
Are we here now, then? Yeah, we're we're here down in a little place on uh, Princess Royal Island. That's a real special spot. And uh, as you could see, we've got old growth forest. Yeah, you could see all the fish parts there, too. You so is that, is that indicating bones. that there's some bears around? Yeah. Shall I just wave my arms at, at you if there's a bear? Uh, <laughs> no, it, it, with you guys, you guys just stay all together and you'll be fine. Yeah, so when you see lichen growing like this, it's a sign of a very healthy uh, old growth forest. Uh, you'll only find lichen um, and mosses growing like this in, in areas that are ecologically healthy and um, have a lot of old growth trees. It's quite beautiful, eh? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Central to the deal's success were the people of the First Nations, who are believed to have lived here for 8,000 years. A number of these communities skillfully brokered the deal between environmental groups such as Greenpeace, logging companies, and the government. So what are we looking at here? Okay, here we're right alongside of a uh, salmon bearing stream, and that really means that this, this creek has all the, uh, the right things happening for salmon to come and spawn. So it's either bears, wolves, minks, otters, eagles, you know, harvesting the fish, bringing it up into the forest. And that is why we have all, these, all this different life happening right here on the side of, a, side of a creek. And you can see the moss is, you know, just rich and, you know, the different lichens, everything's thriving off of what uh, this, not only just water, but the life that comes to it helps, you know, replenish the forest. It's a fairly fresh kill too. Yeah. For First Nations like the Gitga, the sea and the forest provided everything, including strips of bark sustainably harvested to roof their lodges. I would probably say that's probably close to, you know, maybe 100 to 200 years old in between there, mm. when this, this was peeled off, and it could be uh, even more. How important on a day-to-day -day basis is this agreement? This to us really helped us in a sense of uh, slowing things down to where it was a workable pace. This is basically like a living monument of our people. So we look at it as like a standing museum, how important it is for our culture. Hunting is not permitted in protected areas as part of the agreement. Camera traps are one way to monitor the wildlife and deter would-be hunters. But you could really see the spots where the bear has turned, just like us with these paws there. You could see there's no moss there. Yeah. All right, how's this thing work then? How do we get this off? I'll take the card out and then you could start uh, dismantling and taking the camera trap off the tree. All right, let's see some bears. Oh, there's a bear. There's a bear oh. right up close. Oh yeah, black you know, bear. Yeah. So a bear, right, it would, would sit on this log and scoop fish? Yeah, oh yeah. This is really good, one good pool. Yeah. And that's the reason why I chose this spot for the camera trap. There's a lot of really good pooling spots where the fish were trapped. Oh, this wow. One of the images, that very log we walked up, the bear had climbed onto it and walked away. So, you know, this is either early morning or uh, just as it's starting to get dark at night. Our latest word for it is moxcomal, meaning white bear. Moxcom is white and all is bear. Mm. But uh, what everybody else knows this guy is his spirit bear. You so caught him on camera. Yeah, so it's really nice to, uh, to know that he's still using the stream here.
mother and baby bear, but it was terrifying. Uh, Marvin says we're very safe, though, because they're trusting us. They saw us filming, and they just carried on eating. But it was, uh, it was both exciting and quite terrifying at the same time. So what's next for the Great Bear Rainforest? It's absolutely extraordinary what has taken place here over the last 10 years. Um, nothing like it anywhere in the world. And um, the, the forest is much more protected than it has ever been. This is where I say right now, people in BC and Canada should really step up to the plate and, you know, be responsible for the choices they're making. And, and it's really sad that I have to say that when this is my territory, but I'm asking for help. Uh, for, for not just the people in BC, but all of Canada and around the world. And to be sustainable in, in our own territory is really what we're trying to do. Great, well thank you both very much. You're welcome, thank you. More work is required to maintain the delicate balance between economic and environmental interests needed to keep the forest truly safe. But as long as groups can unite in a common purpose, wild places like the Great Bear Rainforest will survive. In Germany, as in the rest of the world, bees pollinate about 80% of all fruit, vegetables and flowers. But, like the rest of the world, bee numbers are in decline. Mites, disease and the use of pesticides have almost halved their numbers. I'm Sinead O'Shea and I'm in Berlin to meet some people who have decided to take some action. Come on, I'll show my, <laughs> you, you. my bees. Are these bees going to sting me? I hope not. Um, <laughs> in Berlin, we are breeding the bees for calmness. I, I kind of want to test that theory because it sounds amazing. <laughs> bee lover Dr. Mark Kofink has hives on six roofs around the city. The bees pollinate all the higher uh, plants like uh, fruit trees or vegetables. So without bees, you only get potatoes. With the bees, you get the carrots and the aubergines and the tomatoes. Berlin is a very green capital. We have a lot of parks, a lot of trees. Surprisingly, this varied plant life together with their milder climates means that cities can actually offer better habitats for bees in the countryside, where monoculture farming is bad news for bees' health. So there are the hives at the back. Yes. Okay, it's a lot of them. <laughs> yes. A new generation of enthusiasts, like Nicole, one of the city's 570 beekeepers, are discovering just how well bees can thrive in urban areas. Yeah, it's amazing. They're just all crawling all over. Yes. Today. Bees are low maintenance. They need just a couple of hours of attention a week. And for centuries, their products have been celebrated for their health benefits. Bees are collecting the sap from trees and um, bring it in their hive. It's a um, natural antibiotic. So it would protect them from diseases, would it? Yes. The humans too. <laughs> so, good night. Sleep well. <laughs> At the iconic Berlin Cathedral, biologist Corina Hulzer tends to its new rooftop residence. It's part of a project called Berlin Sumt, or Berlin is Buzzing, which aims to promote beekeeping by setting up hives on the roofs of famous buildings. This is pretty amazing to find some beehives on top of this amazing building. What is the purpose of this? It's a sign. Um, to all of the Berlin people, um, bees are important to us. Bees not so happy these days, and uh, we all can do something about it. Berlin is one of many cities worldwide experiencing a beekeeping renaissance, as more urbanites seek to reconnect with nature and produce their own food. The classic honey of Berlin is actually the, the lint, and it tastes very, very um, strong. I mean, it's a bit like Berlin in the summer, 
yeah, is very intense. Yeah. The date actually tells you what's in the honey, so which flower, which nectar. I'm a beekeeper for five years and um, I've got these eight colonies in Kreuzberg on the roof. Maybe next year I can even have um, double. <laughs> Urban hives produce around 200 euros worth of honey per season. But their contribution to the long-term well-being of our bees could be priceless. These old houses may look wonderful, but in fact they leak energy like sieves and produce carbon dioxide which contributes to global warming. But this can be stopped, and inside some of these properties there are drastic changes afoot. I'm Amanda Burrell, and I'm here to meet some of London's retrofitting pioneers. Amanda, Hello. nice to meet you. How are you doing? Good, you. Good, thank you. Please, will you put these on? OK. It's a dangerous area, is it? It is. This property is having a home energy retrofit. It's being updated to make it more eco-friendly. As you can see through here, we are currently just installing the insulation. We have insulation on the external walls, um, and we have insulation on what are called the party walls, the, the walls that join this house to the next house. Down here, we are insulating the chimney rests at the moment. Traditionally, um, this would be a, an area of significant heat and air loss. A retrofit like this costs around 15% of the total renovation, in this case, £10,000. But as a result, energy bills will be much less. We have here one of the layers of insulation, this is mineral wool insulation that's pre preventing the heat from escaping up through the flat into the flat above. This is the layer of OSB, the oriented strand board, and this will act as our airtight layer. And then we will tape all the joints to prevent even the smallest amount of air escaping because that is exactly the problem. This house might look the same as all the others on the street, but I've been told that actually it's radically different. Hi, Tom. Hello. Okay. Nice to meet you. Wow, what a beautiful house. So what's different about this house? So this is the UK's first family home to be retrofitted to a passive house. A passive house is a type of house that uses much, much less energy to heat it and light it. In this case, we use about 90% less. So how do you do that? How does it work? We do that by super insulating the walls by installing highly efficient windows, in this case all the windows are triple glazed, and by making the house more or less completely airtight so that we can control the heat loss. Can you show me around? Absolutely, let's start with the ventilation system. Tom Packenham is the director of Green Tomato Energy, which specialises in retrofitting to low energy standards. As a model for what could be done, he transformed his own home for the cost of £50,000. So, because the house is sealed, you need to bring fresh air into the house all the time, otherwise people would suffocate. So the air comes in from the outside and passes down through this pipe, which is hidden behind this trellis, down under the ground into the house. It circulates fresh air all around the house constantly. And then the old stair layer comes out from a similar sort of pipe and is taken out and expelled. And every two and a half hours, all of the air in the house has changed. So it's constantly got lovely, fresh, warm air in the house. And there's a machine in the basement which has a couple of fans in which brings air in and takes air out. A super duper machine. Should we have a look at it? Yeah. Gosh, it's complicated in here. <laughs> sort of engineer's dream. So this rather nondescript looking unit is called a mechanical ventilation and heat recovery machine. It does a lot of different things. Pipes from this machine lead to ducts in the floors and ceilings, providing ventilation in every room. Stale air and moisture is sucked out from the kitchens and bathrooms. Heat from these is extracted and passed to the fresh air that goes into the living areas. On very cold days, a small heat pump warms this incoming air. 
This, together with insulation and draft proofing, means the house stays warm even in the British winter. Down the back here, we've got our solar thermal hot water tank. So <clears throat> the, the heat from the sun gets put into this tank thanks to the, this, these little tubes, which carry very, very hot fluid from the roof. If you feel there, you'll feel it's, that's at 80 Ooh. degrees centigrade. Oh, that's hot. That's, that's really hot. I actually can't hold on to it for more than a few seconds. Okay. It works. And here's the source of that heat. On the roof, we have three solar thermal panels, which make hot water. Those uh, take the heat from the sun, and they heat up the fluid that runs through them, and take that heat into the hot water tank, and heat up the water in the hot water tank and they generate about 70% of our annual hot water needs. Um, so on a day like today, they'll fill up the tank with 600 litres of water, 60, 70 degrees. And if it were cloudy for the next five or six days, we would still have hot water from them. You need to clean them every so often. Take the dust off the top. If there's too much dust, it reduces their efficiency. You have your sock. My high-tech sock. Wipe the dust off. Well, you don't want to have vertigo if you go solar, do you? No. Being up here is great because actually it's, it's very, very hot and you can really feel the power of the sun up here. Tell me about these panels. What are these ones doing? So these are solar photovoltaic panels. They convert the sunlight into electricity. Uh -huh. This system is quite a small system, but at the moment um, it's producing, generating all the electricity that the house is using in the fridge and the ventilation system and the pump for the solar thermal panels, etc. And can those take you through a British winter? Through the course of the year, you get the most electricity is generated during the summer months. Um, but the system will continue to produce, generate some electricity throughout the whole of the year with uh, very low amounts in the winter months. 20% of all of our energy requirements are generated by the, these panels. Electricity is the sole source of power. They're quite dirty, aren't they? In winter, any extra needed comes from the national grid. But when it's warmer, these panels can generate more power than the house requires. This is fed back into the grid on a daily basis in exchange for a small fee. The idea of retrofitting is beginning to spread. Tom's company is advising two housing associations, each with thousands of properties, on how to be more energy efficient. I find it really exciting being up here because Tom's house seems pretty revolutionary. And looking out at all the properties behind me, I can't see any other solar panels. So I get a real sense of potential of what could be done here and how the city could be made more eco-friendly. You're in the, one of the safest places on the planet to ride a bicycle. So what about rush hour traffic? Uh, rush hour is, uh, is, is, it's not for beginners. 